more, a little more preparation, a little more, a uh, little more, I won't call it bits and pieces, but um, a little more preparation talking about some of the essential features that go into building best state-of-the-art transformers. And um, basically what we're going to do, one more thing, I'm going to abuse your patience for one more brief period. Um, there's one more advanced feature of neural networks that couldn't fit in before, and they're called residual connections. And it's actually a really incredibly simple idea. In fact, many of the ideas are very simple. It's just a lot of them, you know, and they're put together in surprising ways. And then I want to go back to just remind you about attention. That is the focus of the transformer, the state of the art, this idea of attention. And show you how, in fact, attention doesn't play well with recurrent networks. And so in transformers, they abandoned the idea of recursion or recurrent networks, where you have these arbitrary sequences that you're working on in your current assignment. And um, so we're going to go back to fixed length sequences, which is where we started. It's why I teach this in a somewhat of a historical way. Um, progress is not always in one direction. Sometimes you go back and you take an idea and you refit it, and you know it's progress in science is complicated. So, in even the most state-of-the-art systems, you have one-hot encodings. You know, you have all these different things that we talked about. In some sense, you have n-grams. You know, it's all of these things play a role. Um, and then we're gonna. This is the first lecture. We're going to go through the large sort of uh, outlines without dive, diving in too much. I'm not going to show you any code. Uh, the transformer architecture. And we'll look at the encoder today. And then next time, we'll finish up with the decoder and talk about you know, how it works and, and look at some examples. So without further ado. Oh, are there any questions before I forgot to ask? Any concerns, questions? I've, I've postponed the due date in the assignment. We're all busy this time of year. After break, I'll really try to get the last homework ready uh, before break or soon after break starts and have that. Then you have the project, which is due very late. Uh, the graders have finished their job on homework three, and I just have to look through it. And I'll try to do that tonight. Homework four, try to grade by the end of this weekend, this coming weekend. Okay? You won't have the current homework um, back in time to decide whether you uh, want to do the last homework. But um, this one is pretty open ended. You've got a lot of choices and a lot of playing around with the art of machine learning instead of trying to make it look like my diagrams. Um, so I want to encourage you to just put the time in and not worry about your grade. Because if you put the time in, you'll get whole credit. Okay, just you know, play around with five different ideas. Stop worrying. That's the wrong advice this time of year. Worry, but not too much. Okay. Happy to talk more about this. Um, It, it sounds like a whole new thing. Uh, it sounds like what another feature we have to talk about. But it's really a, 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 just an, a very, very simple idea. Very simple. A um, traditional feed forward network here coming, the output at the top coming down. You have a layer, you have a layer, you have a layer, you have another layer, and that goes on for a while. It's called feed forward because the information comes through. Maybe it's an embedding, and it comes through and it filters through the layers. We talked about uh, in the video I posted about you know the relative width. You know, lots of times people will think of you know it gets smaller. You'll see in the transformer they do it the other way, they make it bigger and then they make it smaller. Sort of interesting. Um, but here's what you do. 
in a residual layer. And as I said, it's three lines of Python assigned to state. Very, very, very simple to implement. The idea is to just take the data from some earlier stage of the computation in the feed forward. Normally, we've gone up this way, coming down. It comes down through, us, say, an embedding. And you just take a shortcut around some layers. And then you aggregate it here, OK? So it's a short circuit connection. And it provides another pathway during the feed forward and another pathway during back propagation. And the curious thing, at least, I continue to find this curious, and I haven't quite worked out in my head why this works. <coughs> but bless you, when they aggregate, I've used this term aggregate, you have some information from this connection that came through the layers. Let's say it's an embedding of length 512. That has come through 512 here, 512 here, comes around, and you put them together. And I always think, well, why don't you concatenate them, and then you have both. But that's not typically what they do. I find this, I don't know if anybody else finds this surprising. But you get information here, and you get information here. And you add them together. It's like you're having a conversation over the phone with this gentleman, you're having a conversation here, and you're having a conversation there. And we decide, well, we'll just aggregate them all. So you all talk at once. This makes no sense to me, but that is what they do. It can, the, the, the network responds to that kind of aggregation. And I've never quite gotten it through my head why this works. And maybe someone will explain it to me. It, I just find it surprising. Uh, maybe I'm thinking too much in terms of digital logic, uh, getting confused. But uh, when they typically aggregate, we'll see this a number of times today. They add them together. 512, 512, they add them together. So these were these kind of uh, short circuit called residual. It's, a re it's left residual left from an earlier stage. It just gets brought around and added here. So it's as if you take some part of the signal and transform it, but only part of it. It's very <coughs> odd. Okay, I'll stop talking about how odd I think it is. Maybe you don't think it's so odd. Um, why was this done? Well, in vision, I have, I have said, I said in the lecture video that I posted, uh, in NLP, you tend not to have really deep networks. Three, four, or five, layers, and, well, and the transformers, too, we'll put the lie to that. But up to this point, uh, given what we've had recurrent network, you might have, you have an embedding layer, you maybe have one or two LSTM layers, maybe one or two linear layers, but that's about it. It doesn't really do you much good to go deeper. Um, so we get the transformers. But in uh, video, in audio, uh, well, audio and in image processing, it turns out that uh, very, very deep networks were explored, and, and they're very useful. The information hierarchy and the way that you know a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional scene gets parsed, gets understood by the network, these very deep networks uh, turn out to be useful. So here is a 34-layer network. <laughs> All of these are convolution and various sizes and pooling layers. And here's a famous network, G VGG19, uh, has 4, 8, 16, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, that's their first year. Or 20 layer, I guess. Um, maybe it's the 18. I'm not sure. But in any case, um, these very, very deep networks. Well, they found that uh, what happened when they started uh, making these very deep networks, this is 20, I guess, and this is, uh, I'm confused, 34, where did 56 come from? Well, that's, it's, it's not this diagram. But as you make more layers, 56 layers, 56. As they made these deep networks, they just performed worse. And 
you know, I would have said, duh, of course, it's too thick, you know, it's too deep. So playing around with them, uh, they decided to try the following idea, and that is that they put in these residual connections, and you can actually see that the connections here, um, essentially, you can skip from the very beginning, and if you follow this path, it goes all the way down to here. This one has everything from the first layer, and they, they do it every two, everything from the second layer, the fourth. The, everything gets aggregated together down here, and they add it. But when they did it, they found that, um, here's the plane, this is, this is plan. oh yeah, so this goes with this, sorry. This is 18, and that's the blue, and this is the loss. And here's the 34 layer, not any worse. But when they added the residual connections, uh, they got an improvement. So, I've said this a number of times, and it's a really kind of frustrating thing for a scientist to say, but this is an art. I mean, they just tried it, and it worked. So then they kept experimenting with it, right? Uh, I don't think there's any really developed theory about why this worked. It, it just is a, is a practical matter. They tried it, and okay, let's expand on that. So about as much theory as I can offer you is the following. If you think of three feed for three linear layers, they basically take an input and provide a linear transformation, right? It goes through the network, something comes in, something comes out, let's assume it's all the same width, 512, whatever. And then you put these, you put these between them. Now this is a, I don't know the previous diagram, but you can see that in order to get here, uh, you had to add to this, then you had to add to this. So it's not like you can jump from the beginning all the way to the end in this particular design. There are also designs to do that. But here's what it, um, it, here's what it sort of unrolls as. And that is, if you consider unravel, it's not through time, but just through all the different paths. One path is straight through, and that's right here. So that's one path that can get you to here. Now another path would be to, uh, to take, let's see, uh, yeah, well this one, right? That path and this way. And then another path would be including this one or not, that's here, right? And so this path, there's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, and neither. But four different possibilities, whether you took this or not. So you're getting more network for the same price or something like that, right? And then when you get the third one, you have this, right? You have everything you had here, and plus you have this one. So there's all these different paths which put these linear layers into different, all these different combinations. And when I look at things like this, I say, why would that possibly work? You know, why is that a good idea? But then when you do an experiment, you find it does work. And so this is a way of making the network more flexible in that it can, in some sense, combine the effect of all of these different layers, and uh, you get a richer output. You get more combinations of outputs. But what I just, I'll shut up about this, but I just find it stunning that they just add. And here, this is a combination, the addition of how many different paths? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different paths come into this. Eight different ways where you have different amounts of F and different amounts of G and H. It's quite, quite interesting to me. So residual layers have been around for a long time. And in fact, in the early days, um, people tried all sorts of things. 
network of neurons and cycles, and this is called graph uh, neural network, and tried all kinds of crazy things. And these have been tried since Hopfield network from the 50s. Honestly, it's, it's gone back a half a century. And most of them just didn't work all that well. And what's come out of the last couple of decades, the last couple of years, especially is certain designs that won out that are an advantage. And, that, and that's what I'm presenting to you. That's what's in the book. But uh, on that note, if you look at state-of-the-art results in uh, lots and lots of problems, you'll see the description, and Kaggle, you know, you'll see these descriptions of very weird networks, very specialized techniques that people have tuned. So in this current assignment, you're going to try to tune and see if you can come up with some design somehow right, that solves the problem in, you know, in an optimal way or in a good way. And people have been doing this for decades, and they come up with very strange designs that, that work. And this is one of these... And we're just heading into an area where uh, there's just a lot of strange ideas that turned out to work well together in practice. And it took a very long time for people to, to figure this all out. And it took the hardware so that people could run these experiments. They had to be able to run these huge experiments. And try to. Okay. Um, enough philosophy. So how do you do this? It's the simplest thing in the world. I mean, look at this. If you want a residual... Here's your forward pass, okay? You save, you save your input here in a variable, a Python variable. Then you send it through a layer with Rello, and then you save the output from that, and you save it here. Then you send it through another linear layer, and then you add these two, and then you send it through another Rello and out. It's just adding three assignment statements. Yes? What if the um, dimensions change? The dimensions with the dimensions? No, no, because you're adding. They're all the same width, and you just add them. That's what I find really weird. No, they don't get to Is that your question? That's, that's the weird thing. Suppose that, you know, this comes in. Uh, well, this says hidden dimension. Uh, Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, in this example, I screwed this up. I screwed, you're absolutely right, very sharp. Yeah, I didn't account for the length here. I would have had to make the, the width the same. My mistake. You're absolutely right. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah. So it's not exactly the same. But it's still kind of strange. <laughs> because if these dimensions are the same, then you can just add them. Um, I don't. I think that they, every time I've seen this, the widths are the same. Yeah, the widths are normal. Is that what you were going to say? Somebody had a hand up. Yeah, I was just going to ask, that, if so it's a requirement basically for the model to have, um, the layers have to have the same width. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're going to do this, simple-minded thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is wrong. Because, uh, because these might not be the same. Um, but uh, the, the point, I, I think, this is a programming issue, which I didn't, didn't see when I put the slide together. Um, but, you know, what can you do with it? Well, almost anything you want. Uh, you, can do the, you can do them, just pretend these are all the same width. You can take a residual from the input. This is the input to the layer to the input layer, right? And I can save that. And then I send it through the linear layer and the Rello, the nonlinear activation. Then I grab it after I do the Rello. Then I do this one. But now I'm going to add them together before the Rello. So you can combine these sort of any way you can write the assignment statements. And again, I keep returning to this issue that which one is better? It's me. Um, you try different things, and people have found different uh, techniques to work. I think over time, uh, among people who do this kind of thing every day, all day, 
you know, in, in a certain domain, you develop a feel for what the model is doing. I know that um, uh, Brian in our department working on very specific problems, he has a certain design and I'm sure he tweaks it, but he's not just trying every possible idea. So this is anyway, another tool in your toolbox uh, to have these residual connections. Fascinating. So let me just remind you how attention works. Remember what the idea is. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna end up talking about the encoder in, in the transformer. And I'm, there's some details I'm gonna skip because they're completely confusing and just a, too deep of a dive. But I want you to get the feel for how the mechanism is working. So just to remind you, here's the idea. When you want to translate this French sentence into that English sentence, or if you want to take this English sentence and summarize it, or if this is a question and that's the answer, you have an input sequence and an output sequence. And this is processed in some way. Right? And the model that we were talking about was you're going to develop, you're going to you're going to produce the first token, then the second. Then. And by the time you get here, the point is that the choice of that word depends in different ways on this sequence. And so this is the most important, or actually this is the most important, this almost is important, this sort of important, this, this has nothing to do with it, this has very, very, very little, to, and so forth. And so what you have is the idea of attention is to have a probability distribution on a sequence which tells you how important each one of these tokens, each one of these words, is when you get to choosing that one. Now think about it in terms of parts of speech. Same deal. If you are here trying to say this is either a noun phrase or a verb, it would depend you know, hit there would be one to one, there'd be one to one sequence. That's not true here. But you could say that, well, if I just see the word bill, I don't know whether it's a verb or a noun. So I'd have to look and see, oh, is there another verb? Is there, you know, blah, blah, blah. there's other parts of the sentence, right? And so we talked through, this is the design that was used in the first paper. Uh, they didn't call it attention, and they called it long-range dependency, something rather. And here's the design. Uh, you have a bi-directional, typically a bi-directional recurrent network. It, here's your input sequence. And the whole point is that as I am generating each one of the outputs, I want a probability distribution on the input sequence. And that was, that's what this is. Each one of these, okay, sums to one is a probability distribution. And for this one, the first one, it told me when I was translating this, what I needed to know to generate the first word. And there's a feed forward network. It does a soft max. Hey, look at this. A residual connection, well, not really. Uh, it's multiplying because that's the softmax, which tells us how, uh, how to use the outputs, the activations from this layer. And then when you're generating the second one, here it is. Here, and these weights are learned from your data. Okay? They're learned from the data. So you train it. This part, <laughs> you know, this gets trained, this gets trained, and it generates, this basically is generating these attention weights. So that was where things were about 10 years ago. Um, and remember we looked at this, I'm just repeating some slides, that show these are actually printouts of what happened in that attention matrix. Okay, as you went through, here's, the, here's what came in, here's what came out. And this is, each one of these is the attention matrix on all of the inputs as you generate the output. So it turned out, you know, for this one, European, European, you know, it was out of order, right? 
here uh, was signed uh, de signe or whatever. <laughs> and you had to, okay, you know, it, it showed how, how these were related. And you notice that it's not very complicated. You'd think that, you know, this just sounds like a really complicated thing to do. But it turns out that the probability distributions are pretty easy. Um, they, there are, you don't see any long-range dependencies here. So that was a tension the way it was about 10 years ago. And here's what happened. Uh, BRNNs or RNNs have this problem because they have one memory that's going to go through this sequence, which can be very, very long. Uh, I forget what I asked you to do in the first problem. I think 100 or maybe 200. But you could go through, you know, 200 tokens. And one memory, one set of connections and weights inside the layer uh, is basically a matrix is learning what's in that input sequence. But the problem is this vanishing gradients problem. As the sequences get longer, okay, then basically what you have is that you have a lot of information about what's nearby, but the gradients are going to vanish as they get manipulated and smaller and smaller and smaller. So effectively what you have, if you think about that diagram, you have a pretty clear view of what happens around the center, but as you go off to the edges, it just fades away. It all fades away so that, in general, that works pretty well. You know, these are not very, in each one of these, if this is the weight, these are the attention weights, the columns, you can see that they're not very deep. You know, here's maybe three. And it's focused pretty much on the diagonal. And, it, you know, that, that works okay um, for simple translations. For simple translations, it's not bad. You can focus around somewhere in the sequence and get a feel for what's going on. But as you get further away, it becomes less and less effective. So recurrent networks and attention are trying to do two different things. Okay? They're trying to do two different things. And so with great regret, I suppose, I don't know, it went back to the idea of fixed life sequences. And we're back to the idea that we're just going to have a, 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 a vector, a vector of vectors, we're just going to have a sequence that's a fixed maximum size, and you're going to live with it. You're not going to have this idea that the recurrent can keep going as long as you want. So they gave up of the idea of recurrent networks. I just said that. So, now we have to go back to the idea that our, our, our network is going to have a fixed input layer of a fixed maximum size. And if you have sentences which are too short, you pad them. Pad. Just pad, 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 pad. You know, you just pad them. And uh, if they're too long, I guess you chop them. <laughs> Can't really do that, but um, so the the first design uh, in attention is all you need. This paper, uh, 512 tokens long. So if you look at that, you remember the probability distribution we did from our you know first homework. Not too many sentences are 512 words long. I did take from that. So in later designs, I don't know what it is in chat GPT. Mike thought it was four times that. 2048, uh, but I may be wrong. But there is a fixed size. Oh, here it is. Yeah, here it is. <laughs> I just said. Um, there's no theoretical upper bound. Uh, it's just how much network do you build? So the first design was 512, and they experimented with that. Okay. So we're back to <laughs> an old idea. But uh, remember, neural networks don't care what order the 
input they're in. They don't care. They just don't care. You can train a, a, a network. If you take all the pixels in an image and consistently shuffle them, it'll do perfectly well. It will absolutely do just the same thing. It is invariant. It does not matter what order they're in because it's symmetrical, right? About all of the neurons could be exchanged. Everything's symmetrical. It doesn't care about order. But we need order. We need to talk about order. So how do we encode the order of words in a sense for a neural network? OK. Now here's where things get a little bizarre. The first thing that would occur to you, I often say this, right? the first thing that would occur to you, um, it's simply indices. So here, instead of adding them, I have aggregated by concatenation. Uh, I don't think adding would work at all. But uh, let's just say we aggregate them by just concatenating. So what you do is you take a one-hot representation, probably, of 0 and then 1 and 2, all the way up to 512. You have a, an encoding vector on the left side here, which is 512 long with a one hot, you know, depending on where you are in the future. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, it, it doesn't understand relative distances. It doesn't understand that maybe a connection like this is also true here. It doesn't understand the length of sequences. It's very tied to uh, the length of the sequence, it doesn't generalize well. You can't have a sentence that has certain properties and then you give it a longer sentence which has exactly the same properties, exactly the same dependences, but maybe spread out a little bit because you put a subordinate clause in the middle. You know, instead of um, Wayne is the professor of CS 112 and he was giving a lecture on positional encoding. Okay, that's the sentence. Then you say, Wayne is a professor of CS 505. So I was just talking to somebody that wants to. 505, which is taught on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. And, you know, and then you continue. Now you put that subordinate phrase in there. It shouldn't affect the rest of it. But it, this just doesn't understand that. It can't, it can't understand. It can't generalize. The whole point is generalizing. The whole point is not memorizing, but generalizing. And when you do this, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. The neural network just doesn't like it. Um, it doesn't capture the relative position of words, you know, that, that an adjective will go before a, a noun, but in French it will go after, you know. It, it, it can't make these, it doesn't understand relative position because it just has these fixed representations. And finally, um, neural networks just work better with floating point numbers, continuous representations, than with uh, integers. It, they work better with uh, dense floating point representations. So you can say, oh, okay, well then we'll do this is zero, this is one divided by five, twelve, this is two divided, you know, you go from zero to one. Uh, that didn't work either. For the first two reasons. So. People were stuck on this. And then um, the original paper that introduced transformers um, resurrected, I mean, they used an idea that's been around in other places, signal processing and so forth. What, and I'm not going to go deep into this, but basically uh, there's going to be an encoding. There's going to be an encoding of the position. That's the orange part. So this is the position encoding. So in order to do the position encoding, they didn't want, they didn't want just like a one hop. They wanted continuous, they wanted floating point representations. And what they really wanted was an embedding, which is a sequence of floating, a dense sequence of floating point numbers. This is what networks do really well with. They really do well with dense representations. This is why word embeddings are so significant. And what we really wanted was a dense embedding 
of position. And without going into the complex arithmetic of it, which is illustrative, um, basically the idea is that here's a sequence that the, the words don't matter. Okay, the encoding given a certain embedding length. Here's the length of the embedding. What we're going to do is build a a width for the dimension is four. One, two, three, four. Okay, of zero, one, two, three. It's just zero, one, two, three here. And what they do is they combine sines and cosines. And so the even numbered indices in the dimension embedding are sines, and the odd numbers are cosines. And then they have a certain formula that they use to combine these. To combine these. So this is going to be 0.14, negative 0.99, 0.3, and it will be dense. Okay. And it's packed with information. So here you see, here's this one, right? Here's this one, and so forth. But these are signs based on a certain formula. You can see the pattern. I, it, you know, I can't explain more than that. But um, you can see a certain pattern in these. And they tried various formulae. And what they ended up with then is that, in this case, the zero will be 0, 1, 0, 1. So it's a combination of sine, zero sine, one for the cos. Okay. And then the next position is well, sine of one, cosine of one, sine of one tenth, cosine of one tenth. If we went to the next one, it would be sine of a hundred, and so forth. And then two of one, two of one, two over ten, two over ten, two over a hundred, two over. That's the that's the pattern. And you end up with these numbers, which are dense. There aren't a lot of zeros. Well, two of them. And so using this pattern, which I find truly bizarre, uh, you end up, and you see this in, uh, if you look at any paper on, on embeddings, you'll see that, OK, the first one is all, there's one is yellow, zero is dark. Basically, the first row is all 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And the next one is these patterns. Right. It goes off. And so this is a graphical design. It's sort of cool looking. I can't get much insight out of it. But um, this is the numbers 0, sequence numbers 0 to 99 in an embedding that is 512 quotes deep. So this is, a, this is a positional embedding. And the important thing is that every one of these is going to be different. And these are, point, these are vectors in four-dimensional space. And in fact, it's sort of interesting. They sort of rotate as you go th in complex arithmetic. As you go through the, they, they sort of rotate in higher dimensional space. So there's, there's some mathematics behind it, which is not worth going through. But in any case, this truly bizarre idea, uh, which was used by the original transformers, Again, they aggregated them by adding them to the word embeddings. I don't understand. So you have your word embedding, okay? And let's say it's a glove embedding, but it's 512. And then you get the positional embedding of which word? Zero, one, two. And you add them. So you would get the, sorry, you would get the embedding if we do it here and the dimension is four, you get the embedding in four dimensions for i, and you add it to zero, one, zero, one. And you get the embedding in four dimensional space of m, and you add point, and you add it, you add them together. Addition. Truly bizarre. And it works very well, <laughs> surprisingly. It's a continuous representation. It's a dense representation. The main thing to take away from this, it's an embedding. And the embedding is a dense representation in a higher dimensional space, 
which has certain positional properties. And um, basically, if you, if you think of this embedding as rotating these numbers in some di higher dimensional space as rotating, you know, the relative positions are just different rotations of the vectors, okay, the position vectors. And so it makes, it makes sense. You're combining two embeddings here. They're in a very useful range. They're from zero to one, which neural networks like. They don't like real big numbers, right? So when you normalize, you know, that's in the right range. And there's a positional logic to it in higher dimensional space. That is the best I can do. <laughs> but everybody explains that, but that's not what the most modern networks do. That's not what the most modern, the state of the art. Um, BERT, I think, was the first to do this. Uh, GPT-3 and 4, they don't use these sinusoidal embeddings. You know what they do? It's always the same, folks, it's always the same story. It's always the same story. Somebody came along and said, I know it'll work. Let's use sinusoidal embeddings. I read about those in my audio class from 20 years ago at George Mason. You know, <laughs> somebody had this idea and took it from some other field. And they tried it, and it worked really well. Okay. In other words, they came up with a solution that they thought would work as a human being. But you know what works better? Have the machine learn what's the best thing. So, okay. so the modern way of doing it, and it's hard to explain what they mean, just as it's hard to explain what word vectors, the dimensions mean. You have the same exact design, okay, as we've had here, a hundred. 100 positions, the indices 0 to 99, 512 dimensions in your embedding. You know, here it's 4 and 4. This is a matrix, which is like the glove matrix, right, that you got out, or word to back. The rows, in this case, are positions, numbers, from 0 to whatever. And here's the dimension D of the embedding, and you're going to have a dense vector of floats. And these are simply learned during training. The, I've looked at the code for this, and it's very, very simple. You simply do this uh, addition. You have this lookup table, which gives you the embedding. So you put a word in. You know what index it is. You look it up in the positional encoding, and you add it. And you invent this idea, and it works OK. But then the later stage, and it, this has happened over and over, is let's just do that. Let's just take a positional encoding and add it and, you know, give it the index. So where it is, the word embedding plus its sequence number. And we'll add this, but we won't design the matrix ahead of time. We'll let the system learn the matrix. So literally, literally, you take, this is the embedding matrix, that, the lookup table that gives you the embeddings for the, sequen, for the sequence numbers, and you initialize it with random values, just like you do the rest of the, it's part of the, it's part of the parameters of the network in a very simple way. It's one line, it's one line in Python. And so this is a d-dimensional embedding in d-dimensional space. And instead of saying, yes, well, we'll do it, and it'll rotate through, you know, hyperplanes and whatever, just let it figure it out. Let it figure out how to encode positions. And so the network, while it is learning to do everything else, also figures out a positional embedding. It's miraculous. I would think this would work. Um, but it turns out, of course, this adds a lot of training time. <coughs> But they're much more complicated, there's much more complex relationships than you can have with the sinusoidal embeddings. Those are static. Somebody invented them. It's like coming up the rule and saying, here's the way we should do it. But instead, the system figures out for itself what the embedding should be. And they don't make any sense. Just like word embeddings don't make all that much sense. It's just a d-dimensional space. But just like, just like the, uh, just like the, 
sinusoidal embeddings, they're added. They're added on top. I find this stunning. You have a word embedding which has been calculated by a mechanism outside of this by looking at all the words in context in a large corpus. And then you take that from outside and you have a lookup table that gives you the embeddings. And those can be refined and updated as you give it the new information. But as you're doing that, it also learns how to represent encodings. Now, I don't, what I wasn't able to find out is whether they can pre-train these. Uh, I, I would imagine so, but I couldn't find any information on it. Yeah. Do you look the character by character LSD? No, 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 it's not, this is word by word, this is. Okay. The word by word LSD, is that like similar, like the one we're doing in the homework, is that similar to like? Should, uh, problem, problem two. Yeah. Not problem one. Okay. Problem one is just a cool thing that I, that I but it shows, but in that, in that case, it's very simple because you can use one hop, right? It's like 46 or 48, just like, but for uh, word embeddings, I mean, you could do it, but we're not doing it. What about the brackets, like, in the problem? Like, how the brackets match up? Is that because it knows the position? Or? No, that's a recurrent network. Mm -hmm. It somehow figured out that when it sees an opening brace, somewhere it should see a closing brace. How did you remember that? I have no freaking idea. But just in there, because, and remember, that's not a, this is a different paradigm. This is a fixed length sequence. We're, we're, we're given up on the idea of recursion, just kind of figuring it out somehow. Now we're going to have a fixed length sequence. And it's going to say, if there's a parenthesis here, there's got to be a parenthesis there, you know. And that's the relationship between these two. We don't know how far apart they are. Now, in the case of, that's, a, that's actually a nice example. Uh, thanks for bringing it up. In a recurrent network, you have an opening brace, but if the closing brace is 3,000 characters later, which could certainly happen in a programming language, or, you know, opening curly brace, and then you have an enormously long function and a closing curly brace, and they have to match. How would a recurrent ne network remember that? It's got to remember the entire sequence. In some sense, it's got to keep count of the opening parentheses and the closing parentheses. But if you give it enough, in, you know, it'll learn those patterns. But it's not terribly good at it. This is a better idea. So, um, the, give me one thing. So the, in, the word embedding comes from outside the system. You've trained that on a large corpus. And now this is going to learn the positional encoding. What I don't know, and I wasn't there, I did a lot of searching, and ChatGPT was no help whatsoever. Uh, is whether they can pre-train this. I imagine so. I imagine you pre-train it on a large corpus. Yes? What is the input to an individual? Yeah. Like, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's the embedding plus the positional encoding. For a single word. So yeah. You aren't, you yeah. The a single word, you have an embedding, say it's 512, positional 512, you add them together, Right? And each neuron is getting each one of those. Right. And we're about to make it work because this is a fixed length sequence of embedding. It's a sequence of sequences, you know? So we'll get there. Don't you already have the uh, sequence information stored then? But, right, right, yeah. Just think of it right now. I want to say Snyder and it's the third at index three. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm interested in doing. Snyder, three, put them together, send it through the network. Then is four. Professor, but you know, just for right now, we're just thinking of one, of one, it's, it, it, there's a lot to keep track of here. <laughs> but this is just one word with an index telling you where it is in the sentence. Now, we, we'll have to put this together and have multiple copies of this. By having multiple copies of this, though, don't you already encode the position information? Because uh, the inputs are Snyder and is, like, one of those goes to a neuron, which is different than each one of those going to the opposite Very neuron. good question. Very good question. Um, it doesn't quite work like that. Everything gets all mixed up if you get it into the network, and there's going to be multiple layers. So you can't just separate them all like that. But what you're 
saying is saying in some degree true that if you're going to have separate pizza, that at some point you've got to aggregate to figure out what the connections are. That's my understanding. Let's think about that a little more. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> N10,000 is a parameter, sorry, a parameter that they use in their formula. Just, it's a parameter that they use in their formula. And I don't have any better explanation for that. There's a place where there's an N. And it's, uh, it's it has to do with the, the, the formulas that they go on. I should have blanked that out, yeah. So, Now, you're just going to learn these embeddings as you train the network. Okay, now it gets really hairy. So, here is the original design of the transformer. And it's broken into two pieces, okay? It's an encoder and a decoder. It's actually, the connection here is going to be a little more complicated than shown there, but think of it just as an encoder, decoder. You're going to give it a sequence here, and it's going to do the sequence in parallel, okay? And then it has a lot of features we already understand, okay? This is the paper, attention is all you need, 2009, I believe. And what I want to do is just take this a piece at a time. We can't finish it all today, but I want to talk about the decoder. You've already seen a lot of the pieces, okay? Because I went through a lot of these, right? You know that there's an embedding and a positional encoding. Those are added together. And for each one of the inputs, it's got a, um, you know, say a 512 wide vector that's representing one of the words. That's going to go into something called multi-headed attention. Hang on that. But everything else you've seen, right? We've got an embedding layer. We've got positional encodings. We add them together. You have a residual connection around there. Another residual connection up there which you add onto the output of this little piece called multi-headed attention. And then there's a layer normalization. You add it and normalize. Okay? Then it goes into a feed-forward network. Okay? Another residual connection. Add it, normalize. So, I mean, you have understood everything here except for this piece. But let me just focus on the... Uh, Feed forward network. Uh, again, coming, coming up with principles is so hard, at least at this stage in this field, it's still in its infancy, but here's what they found worked in the feed forward layer. Um, the vector which comes out of here, for one of the words, is going to be connected to four times bigger linear layer. So this is a case where it got bigger. Usually we think of them getting smaller, but here this vector they go, in the original paper, went four times bigger, so about 2,000 neurons, went through ReLU, then goes to a second layer, which is, again, the width of the embedding. So the internal data paths are five, in the original are 512 wide. These 512 for the word embeddings, for the positional embeddings. And so you can think of all these connections as being 512. But that's just a feed-forward network. After something complicated, they have a feed-forward section. Okay, we know how that works. Now, and again, coming back, you know, this is a really messy piece. You've got to essentially do this 512 is the width for one input, but you've got to do it 512 times for this fixed sequence. And it sounds like 
you're duplicating the same thing five, twelve times, but you do it with high, you do it with four-dimensional matrices. You have a batch, you have the five, twelve twice, and then you have eight attention heads. We'll get to in a minute. But so this is really just done, just done with linear algebra. But you are essentially doing this process 512 times in a row for 512 inputs, zero positional, zero, one, two, so forth, and all of your inputs. So actually when you look at the code, it's not that complicated. It's a page or two long. Um, and it's all linear algebra. So the piece that we don't understand is this idea of attention and how it's applied. And again, there's going to be a lot of parallelism. Um, and what I don't want to do is go into the details of what's called scaled dot product attention. It's basically, you're going to have three linear layers, which are going to compute a, a value, a key, and a query vector. And basically, there's a matrix in here. All of these have parameters that are learned. And what comes out of these are three vectors, the length of the embedding, which roughly tell you what you're interested in. And this is so vague, it's be useless. But sort of the question you're asking uh, and how you're going to find it and what the result is. It's almost like a query language in a way. It's going to sort of query the input to see what connections are, what dependencies are interesting in a single sentence. Now let's think about that. This is called self-attention. And instead of the diagram I had before, let me just flip back. I'm just trying to give you strong intuitions here because the math and, uh, yeah. In this, this is an input sequence and an output sequence. So maybe that's French to English. Or if they're the same length, it's word embeddings to parts of speech. And so as I'm translating, and I get to that point in the translation, I'm interested in what words in the input are relevant and how relevant they are. But what we do in the encoding, in the encoder, there's no translation yet, right? And so what we are interested in doing is, is calculating self-attention. And self-attention says you have a sentence. The animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. Let's just, almost like an autoencoder. What happens when we think about Transforming a sentence into itself. That's not actually what happens, but that's the idea. What words, if you focus on the word it, what words does that depend on? What are, this, what, are the, what are the things that if you want, if you get the word it, you can build a probability distribution in the same sentence for what words are relevant to it. So it depends on the animal. And it also depends, I don't know why it depends on two, but the point is that each word in a sentence has a relationship to other ones. So when you have a long range dependence like the animal, and you say it instead of he or she or them, right? It's because it's related, there's that long distance dependence. So the way long distance dependencies are encoded in a single sentence is through self attention, okay? So the idea is that it's implemented by a series of linear transformations. There's some scaling to essentially normalize it. Uh, it's actually represented by, you know, uh, you have these learned parameters here, right, which produce these, these uh, values. So really, these are the matrices that are being multiplied in here. And this is, this is going to be your input uh, embedding and what comes out are answers in some sense to these questions. And those are going to be put together with dot product attention. Dot product is 
a slight variation of, of uh, cosine similarity, but it takes account of the dimensions as well. It's a distance formula. And so there's a particular way of, of doing this. And then here you do concatenate. Finally, I get a concatenation. They concatenate them and send them through another linear layer and then do a Kaufman. So this is a way of, without going into any of these details, uh, of learning how sentences relate to themselves, how the words in a sentence relate to themselves. That's basically self-attention. And coming back to your, <laughs> your question, this is repeated eight different times, meaning eight different sets of parameters. They're not shared. And so multi-headed attention has, in the original, eight, and they can go up to 16 or more. Basically, there's eight different ways that this sentence is being compared with itself. And that's eight different random ways to try to find relationships. They may do the same thing. I know you'll have a question, hold on. Um, but you can think of, here is the sentence and the sentence. And here are the eight different heads. So each one of these is an attention probability distribution telling us for each one of these words which words it is affected by, which words it has dependencies on. And they may learn the same thing, but they tend to learn, they, they're random, they start in different places, and people have analyzed this and shown, oh, in some cases it's learning, you know, it's learning subject-verb agreement. In some places it's learning, you know, something else. Anyway, yes. Yeah. It is just kind of duplicating and trying things in different ways and layers. Um, but, but it is designed to do this. And when they look at this probability distribution, it is doing something. It is telling you the relationship between this word and, uh, and itself. And yeah, that's, I, I can't give you a very satisfying answer because I don't know. Yeah. Why is it the strongest link always It is. It is very strong. <laughs> but there are other ones too. If you go back like to the slide about the animal, you see this one. Well that's right here, isn't it? Yeah. It's the same the, one. Except this one has eight different. Yeah. The previous one about the oh, okay. where it was in the top right. Yeah, see like the it link. Oh I don't know. Yeah. That that doesn't yeah, that doesn't make much sense, does it? Okay. Yeah. Unless they just discount that. Unless they just but they you know, they didn't put a zero there. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. You would think that the relationship to itself isn't terribly important, so they just zero it out or something. But this diagram makes it sound like they didn't. I don't know that I depend on that diagram. And you would think that you would see the word, you know, look at this. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know the answer to that. That's a good technical question. But I'm just, you know, the overview here is that you duplicate this process. And so for each one of these three different ways of somehow figuring out the attention, uh, there's a separate matrix that has to be learned. And so it's eight chances to learn interesting things about this, about this sentence and how it relates to itself. Fixed sequences. 
and <laughs> then you stack them. In the original diagram, I didn't talk about this, you have n times. This thing is already essentially through, through the operations, through the four-dimensional matrices that they do this in, um, through the operations, you're doing this 512 times for 512 words. And then you're going into the multi-headed attention, and it's bifurcating, if that's the right word, when you have eight of them, uh, into eight different parallel streams that's trying to figure out what, what to pay attention to. That is aggregated, goes through a feed-forward network, and then all five... 12 book here, you know, and so you have eight of these deep. I can't imagine why this would work, but it does. It works beautifully. And so the lesson here, because, you know, maybe next year I'll have gone through all the code for three months and understand. But the lesson here is that you can't just throw a whole bunch of things together and turn it on and run it for five years and hope that it works. I mean, that's what happened with evolution, right? It had millions of years. So here, a bunch of different ideas, like the positional encoding, like input embeddings, like learning positional encoding, like the idea of attention and trying to, through looking at a lot of data, a lot of sentences, trying to figure out why whenever you see animal, you'll see it and not he. And whenever you see Wayne, you see he. And when you see Susan, you see she. Or when you see a past tense, you see another past tense. All those relationships between all of these pieces of a sentence are going to be analyzed, and we're only in the decoding stage. Uh, I can't, under a couple of things I'm very confused about. Why it's so deep? It just doesn't make sense to me, but these are the designs. So, let me stop here. I've filled your head enough. Um, and next time, what we'll do is go on and look at the decoder. Um, and the decoder is actually, you can see again, see this says n times? This is going to again have many layers. You can see a soft max and a linear layer, you know all those. You can see residual connections, add and norm. There's a multi-headed attention here. And then there's something called masked multi-headed attention, which just means you're going to mask it as you generate sentences. You're going to mask it so it doesn't see the rest of the sentence. But almost everything is repeated here, but then there's going to be connections between these two. So we'll pick that up next time and look at some of the ways that it's used. So I have a question. Some people question, actually. The first thing is... Hey, hey. You know, I haven't been sick in four years. <laughs> well, I got COVID once, but I haven't had a cold or a flu. There you go, right? Uh, um, so I wanted to maybe use like a neural like so side thing. But like, so it's a vending machine, right? You have to know when to fill it up. Four guys have to fill it up, right? So, well, what are you? What is the input and what's the output? Um, well, you get like, if the input is a vector and the output is a vector, a neural network can help. So, like, I guess the input would be the location of the machine, of the daily, like, um, like um, data about. Yeah, exactly. And then, yeah. What's your output? I guess the output, I want to know when it has to, it has to be filled, but like, like the best like, grouping of like things to hit. It's not like a neural network. That's a schedule. 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 So what, what other like, I'm trying to use this in my process. What things I should research, because we really have a process idea. Whatever should I research in terms of computer well, scheduling problems, I mean, this is resource allocation, and, you know, like maybe, maybe. I don't know. I would look under resource scheduling, you know, something like that.
by the office and we could draw it out. Yeah. Song layer. This is the. This is the. Why not do it all together? Yeah, yeah. Here was my idea. Yeah. Um, poor. They weren't musicians. Yeah. They weren't musicians. Yeah. They weren't musicians. Yeah. Parts are natural language. Yeah. Right. You're on like C minor. F. Yeah. You could write it as a natural language. So I think you should go ahead and try the chord sequences and, and use that as data. Yeah. But, but there's so much interest. Now, one thing we haven't talked about is the melodies. Those would have to be encoded, but I, I don't know if we're going to have time. But if you just look at lyrics, and they correspond to chords. Now, you could do them separately, right? But now there's going to be an interaction between the two. And you could, there's a lot of data there, right? Yeah, like lyrics that, like, you know, like, over a well, it, uh, these two people we were talking, they said the reason he thought about it was it was a song and it was real minor key sad and the lyrics didn't fit at all. The lyrics were happy. <laughs> you know? Um, it's a shame we can't do melody, but that's really important, you know? But you could try to do a classification problem or sentiment analysis on chords. But what you have to do is write them out in such a way, you know how, you know how they go like this, they say C, you know, and they go like that, or something, that just means do C. You just have to, you have to write it out every, every bar, or something to figure out a notation to the computer. But that's just a sequence of characters. Yeah. And it, natural language, it's a, it's a linear sequence. That's the most important thing. Yeah, yeah. NLP works well for linear sequences. And a song, the yeah. chart is a linear sequence. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, you're going to have to play around. I don't know exactly how you want to represent it, because when there's a chord change in the middle, I don't know, do you pay? Let's assume there isn't a chord change more than once per beat. Yeah. You'd have to pay C three, four times, four times, four times. Do it for every beat. Yeah, yeah. You got to think about that. Yeah. Reach out and think about that. But I think one of you could do lyrics, you could do the chords, and then you could put it together and see. I don't know. I think this is cool. And, and, and the, the next step after that would be melody. Yeah, that's, that's part of the deal. Also, like, I don't know, like, I don't know how much data they have, but then you have to try and I know, there aren't, you know, I dealt with this before, and there isn't a lot. Yeah. You'd have to write something that would analyze, you'd have to write a machine that would transcribe melodies into some sequence, which you could do, but there's no time for that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I have but talk, talk to them, do it all together. Yeah, more fun. I also, I just have a question about the reflection problem. With the Separate things with separate yeah. feed forward networks that analyze separately eight different ways analyzing the music. Like, who knows? Who knows? It's just eight different chances to learn something. Each of them is initialized randomly. And so they they will end up going into different places okay. in the parameter space. Yeah. And one of them you say, oh, it's noticing tenses. Oh, this one's doing this. But you know what? It never actually plays out that way. It's like with vision. You say, oh, this is memorizing, it's recognizing vertical lines. No, it doesn't do that. It's just like, it's just like doing it. It's really hard to see. And that's one of the problems of kind of playing with these same things. Yeah, and then so it like goes through each of Each of them separately is in parallel, going through and trying to figure out what are the relationships here. And some of them may be focusing on the same thing. If you have eight different chances, yeah. that's the idea. And then pass, pass, then two. That's all aggregated and passed on to the next layer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then I wasn't very clear. It's very confusing. There's yeah. a lot of parallelism going through. And then like, go that, like a tension head, once it's multi-headed, I can pass to the next. Right. It goes through a feed forward layer, and it, then the whole thing repeats in the next layer. It's massively confusing. I'm just trying to give you some insights about the minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought this was interesting. Yeah. So can we go ahead with that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. Um, the question though is what sort of data, right? Yeah, so they have like uh, an open source website and we are talking with the people there and today we have a meeting so they might provide us the data. The it's going to be like a chatbot? Or it's a like a chatbot but we are doing retrieval augmentation so we'll give them links from where we are getting the information. So like we'll even cite the sources. And yeah. There's another group that wants to do for BU. You know there's this thing, REST or something, this little annoying bot that comes up and wants to answer your questions if you go on the main site. Anyway, they want to do a better version of that. And it answers questions about the year. Okay. <laughs> Same idea, right? Yeah, yeah. Just a conversation. Right. Cool. Yeah, I like it. I like the idea. As long as you have the data. Yeah, I think you have the data. Because if you, if you don't have enough data, then you're sort of stuck. It doesn't yes, work very well. Yes, well and, uh, uh, there is a, there's an open source site that you can okay. create and use. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Thank you. Not tighter. <laughs> there is a tighter. Put, put the 
Good. They, uh, somebody was here and they set it up and it worked. You know. I was wondering in the back of my head too. Yeah. But she came in and set it up. And I I don't know. It, as soon as I stopped, it did this. I'm trying. It. It's all fucked up. Our job, our job wouldn't be as exciting as it is. If stuff yeah, right. <laughs> People on the street think of the jobs of computer scientists and mathematicians as, as boring. But oh no! We, we, we know that. Yeah. We know otherwise. Sheer terror. Exactly. <laughs> Anything can happen. It's like they say, air traffic controllers. Yeah. It's it's a thousand hours of sheer boredom and thirty seconds of sheer terror. <laughs> Every once in a while. Anyway, let's see if it works. I I, I don't know. I can't help you. I, she set it up. Oh, oh looking good. Happening. Well, that's a good step. Yeah, uh, you're set. Go. Good to go. Okay, thank you.